And I'm having an awesome, awesome discussion with my special guest, Dr. Claire Simeon. There's a lot of social media, a lot of newscasts about these mass stranding of whales and and you know it's people are going why is this happening is is it the one i even saw one article where it's it's the end of the world it's one of the biblical uh, things about the end of the world but I, I i really dying to know what your take on this is and what relevance does global warming have or anything like that have with it it's well it's great that you that you bring up sort of the the fact that it's visible in social media and it's something that that you're aware of because you know as somebody who's deep within it and working and everything that's a part of my life every day but i always wonder how visible it is sort of to the rest of the public and if it's becoming more and more visible um because you're you're exactly right so Marine mammals are sentinels of the sea. Um, and so they are really able to tell us so much about what is happening in the ocean, what's happening right there, either with food resources or the ocean getting warmer or um, uh, runoff or uh, disease transfer from land to sea. So, so many different things. And sometimes, um, I, I mean, certainly because marine mammals are so charismatic that anytime there's a stranding and certainly anytime there's a mass stranding, it's just there's there's so much attention in the media because they're so visible. Um, and I think that we can really use that, use that to our advantage to tell this story because there's so many changes that are going on in the ocean now. Um, and and so that's really a big part of my job is understanding what they're telling us and, and sharing that story. And it's funny how you said they're the sentinels of the sea. It's like, um, I, in, in my line of work, I say, ear infections are the sentinel for, for food allergies. <laughs> you get, you get to, you get so, that's the excitement level versus it's what you get to do. So much cross, yeah, exactly. So much cross relevance. It's like the exact same, <laughs> exact same thing, different species. What causes a mass stranding versus individual stranding? And it really breaks my heart because I see the babies stranded as well. It's like, are they, is, it, are they, is the herd just following someone's lead or what's going on there? You know, it, it totally depends. So sometimes there are certain places um, in the world where the um, uh, the way that the coastline is shaped can make it confusing for animals. So like Cape Cod is a really great example. It's really shallow and then you've got this arm of land that's coming around. And so groups of animals will sometimes get lost. Um, and so a whole bunch of animals will come up on shore. Sometimes There are some theories that they may be following one sick animal um, or that they uh, that they may have something wrong with their health or their hearing. Uh, and so a lot of these groups, you know, the Marine Mammal Center rescues along 700 miles of California coast and, and the Big Island of Hawaii, but there are organizations all around the country and all around the world that are doing this work and really understanding what's happening um, each time, sometimes there there may be, uh, you know, there was a, a very large mass stranding of say whales down in Chile. Um, and that was the largest die off of these large whales ever recorded in history. And there, while they, there wasn't a definitive answer, it may have been shifting prey or it may have been biotoxins like from harmful algal blooms. And so that's why actually, you know, saving the animals that you can save, but also collecting as much information from animals that pass away is just as important to get to the bottom of why it happens, because it's different depending on where you are. Say whales are, uh, they're definitely a dark color, but they, they're they they're a little bit smaller than, than blue whales, which are the world's largest whale, um, but they're very big. And, um, and they mostly eat, uh, you know, krill and, and other, and little fish and things. And so, um, so, because of the remoteness of the location, it, the most of the animals were decomposed by the time you know humans were able to get out there to take samples. But it looks like it was on a scale of having something like a harmful algal bloom or uh, you know uh, nutritional limitations there. And and do, do, does that algae bloom and the nutrition de deficits does that have any link with global warming, or it's just these fluke things that can happen? I think that, you know, I think it's really important to talk about global warming as an issue that is happening, that climate change is happening, that sea level rise is happening. It's so complex and it can be really difficult to talk about that, you know, because it's, it's hard to say, 
uh, it's hard to say the ocean is getting warmer and that directly killed off this animal, you know? But I think that, that thinking about what our world is looking like as it's getting warmer, as we're seeing these larger storms, as we're seeing, you know, something that's really relevant to us in Hawaii, the monk seals are, most of them live on these really sandy, shallow atolls. And they, they come back to the place where they were born to breed and they come back year after year. And many of those, those places are going underwater because sea level rise is happening. And so when we talk about, you know, feet of change, that might not be something that's relevant to someone that's going to the beach and it's like, uh, your beach doesn't look very changed, but if you're only a foot above the water, then, then you're underwater and that's really significant. So thinking about ways that certain marine mammals are sentinels of this changing, changing ocean and changing environment can really help put the picture into, into clearer focus about climate change. You're making things clearer to me too as well and, and I, I guess you do a lot of education outreach with students and everything like that young kids do you, do you guys get to do that kind of thing yes i really i really like you know we have a whole um education team dedicated to that and i always love working with them because i i think it's so fascinating to think about how to be intentional about the stories you're telling and how that really make resonates with people in the right way so again again in the social media um, there, in, there's that famous whale in Norway that was just uh, filled with plastic and, and all these types of things. And, and there's this one, he's a TED fellow as well, this young, I guess he's 16 now. He devised the system how to clean up the oceans. And uh, I think it was 13 or something he presented it. But yes. yeah. I, I, so what, what's your take on plastics and, and how they affect the marine life as well? I think that plastics, so human impacts um, are, are some of the most visible to the marine mammals that come into our hospital. Um, and anything from entanglement in fishing line or swallowing uh, swallowing plastic. We have a, a whole art sculpture at our, our headquarters in Sausalito where 400 pounds of fishing nets came out of the stomach of one sperm whale. and. And it's so it's so pervasive, and it's everywhere on Earth, and especially in Hawaii, where we have the you know the the Pacific gyre that's bringing all of this garbage that's like twice the size of Texas onto these shores. Um, I mean, plastic is so pervasive, and it's breaking down. We're only beginning to understand the effects of microplastics and how they're getting into the food chain. They're getting into us when we're eating them. They're getting into all life on earth. And, and so I think that the most impactful thing that people can do is to reduce their single use plastics because stopping it from going into the ocean is a no brainer thing that can really help the ocean today. Yeah, and, and that and getting back to the education. So you know, my son's eight years old, and he comes back. He starts talking about this stuff. So so we've invested in. This is this is this is interesting. I don't know if you heard of vet prep, but <laughs> so, so we, we've got these. You know, Ira Gordon, if you're watching, I am not a paid spokesperson, but it's one of those, one of those things. But no, but it, yeah, I, I, we're really getting conscious about this, and I think that the. The marine life, the effect of the marine life, it, it really does hit home. It hits home, and then the um, you know introducing these concepts to the children then brings it home to the family. And it's like, yeah, I I'm, I'm more conscious about how much plastic is in the world. You know, it's like, geez, that's plastic, that's plastic, that's plastic. These this thing really, yeah, it hits home hard. And it's very important that we talk about these serious matters, and, and from an education standpoint, from a from an acknowledge and and uh, you know we need to acknowledge this and, and deal with. Ah!